What is up, everybody? I'm Ryan from Fireside Yankees. Join with my friend and co-host Aiden. And unfortunately, we have to talk about the Clark Schmidt injury. Clark Schmidt went down with a grade one lat strain. He visited Dr. Neil Elatrosh uh, yesterday. Or, excuse, yeah, yesterday. Um, it was determined he'll need a four to six week shutdown from throwing. Now, a four to six week shutdown means you have to build up from that shutdown. So if you are shut down for four weeks, you have to build up for four weeks. That would be an eight week uh, IL stint. If it is, you know, six weeks, which would be worst case scenario, that would be 12 weeks and that's three months. So we're talking about a two to three month uh, window here. Hopefully it's on the two month side instead of the three month side. But this definitely opens up the conversation about whether the Yankees are going to need to start or not this deadline. And my opinion, you can never have enough good pitching. So, uh, you know, Aiden, obviously, you know, the big thing that the Yankees are always active in is the trade deadline. We're actually not too far away now. We are, you know, tomorrow is June. This episode's going to come out on June 1st. It is recorded on May 31st. So if anything happens between 4.17 p.m. Eastern time and the time this episode releases, we would not have known about it. Um, although I don't think any trades are going down. Uh, but right now, the Yankees, you know, maybe they could need to start at the deadline. Whether that's a back-end guy, maybe that's another front-line starter, that remains to be seen. But Aiden, we kind of compiled a, a group of guys. Uh, you know, first off, how are you doing today, my friend? Talk to us a little bit about the Clark Schmidt injury, and then kind of get into your first kind of like, I guess, low-level uh, trade target for the rotation. Yeah, Ryan, I'm, I'm doing okay. Uh, still a little sad about the Clark injury. I mean, it's really just, it's heartbreaking that, you know, this guy finally takes his leap and he looks like a legitimate, you know, established pitcher in the Yankees rotation with, you know, one of the lower, e- lower ERAs. He was running a 2.52 ERA. He was striking a ton of guys out, getting swing and misses, and then he's out with a lat strain, looks like two to three months, or something with his lat. I don't know if it was a strain, but... You know, it's really heartbreaking, um, but, you know, this this does really emphasize the need of getting another starting pitcher. You know, the Yankees have had, you know, absolutely, they've had the best rotation in baseball so far this year. I mean, every single one of them has been dominant, but, you know, even before the Clark Schmidt injury, uh, we were all kind of saying to each other, you know, I think regardless, the Yankees need to go out and get a starting pitcher just for, you know, the depth needs, you know, because... Someone's going to get hurt. Uh, we, we were even saying, you know, when Cole comes back, who's going to leave the rotation? Well, now no one is because someone got hurt. We were saying someone was going to get hurt. So regardless, even before Clark got injured, I'd even argue even before Garrett Cole got injured, the Yankees needed to go and get another starter at the deadline. Now, it's really about how much do the Yankees want to spend? Like how much assets do they want to give up for a pitcher who kind of looks like he's going to be, you know, a temporary part of the rotation. He's more of a depth guy. Um, so, you know, you got your, your lower options, you got your higher options. I think, you know, where we really start, where, where someone I really liked at first, Ryan, when I was looking through some pitchers, I really like Trevor Williams, actually, from the Nationals. He has 11 starts this year with a 2.22 ERA, 2.77 FIP, and a 1.08 WHIP. He's not really a swing and miss guy, but he's consistently pitching like five innings. Um, His peripherals aren't really great. Like he's given up a lot of hard contact a little bit, Um, but you know, he has a really solid ground ball rate. He doesn't walk a ton of guys either. Um, He's also seen a massive improvement in his sweeper and four seam this year. His sweeper peripherally was always pretty good. He was just running into some bad luck, but last year his batting average against his sweeper was 313. And this year, it's night and day. It's a 107 batting average against on his sweeper. So that's really something that kind of piqued my interest. And what makes him a good option is, you know, this is kind of his first year of being, like, a a pretty good, like, rotation pitcher, or his first in a while at the very least. And he's going to be a free agent this year after this year so he's not going to cost a lot like I I don't imagine the Nationals are going to be asking for a ton of assets for Trevor Williams considering he's going to be a free agent next year and just peripherally he doesn't look like you know he's that good of a pitcher he's been running into some really good luck but I think that's someone that you know is could be on the Yankees radar I think it's a cheaper option that fills up a depth need but Ryan I'm curious who's kind of your cheaper rental option that could fill this need for the Yankees 
Yeah, I actually think, you know, once you mentioned Williams, you know, looking at his numbers a little bit, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot to like there. It's a slider kind of heavy profile, not a lot of fastball, so you can go the underwhelming stuff, whatever, but the slider's thrown a lot, the fastball isn't thrown a lot, Max, it kind of masks the fastball. My guy is a very similar pitcher to Williams, and it's Eric Feedy. They actually run very similar ground ball and strikeout to walk rates. Not big swing and miss guys, they rely on ground balls, kind of being savvy veterans, command first pitchers, uh, but kind of in the same vein as Trevor Williams, he cost $7.5 million towards luxury tax this season. Williams costs just five, six point five, so very similar income brackets in terms of uh, where it's going to hit you in the luxury tax. Eric Fetty worked uh, in the KBO last year uh, on working on his slider, turning it into more of a sweeper, uh, kind of mixing in his entire repertoire. So he's a sinker, cutter, slider, changeup. Um, he's throwing all those pitches pretty evenly. Sinker does lead the way at thir- lead the way at 32%, but the cutter 25, slider 22, changeup 21, like all those secondaries kind of get mixed in at similar rates. He has a 2.80 ERA, 64 to third inning. So kind of a similar situation with Williams where you know you're going to get innings out of him. I think we both view these guys as pitchers that like, okay, you could throw them as your five starter if needed come postseason time they're multi-inning weapons who perhaps in these shorter spurts get some velo bumps and those velo bumps potentially help them be a little more effective or they can throw the pitches they feel the most comfortable throwing uh in more situations like if you're Fetty, right like his splits uh suggest he's a little bit better um against right-handed batters than he is against right left-handed batters maybe he feels comfortable with the sinker slider profile a little bit more and he can just kind of hammer that a little bit because he's not facing as many lefties in williams case i imagine he's a little bit better against righties but I could double check right now. Uh, yeah, he's actually, yeah, he's significantly better against varieties. So that kind of situation there. But these guys shouldn't cost you like, you know, they're not going to be in the conversation of, oh, are you trading Chase Hampton? Or are you trading, you know, honestly, even a Clayton Beater. I don't think either of these co- guys are going to cost a ton of the market. And they're both savvy veterans, 31, 32 years old, not too old, and definitely can help you out. So I think I like both these options a lot as a lower term option. Now, kind of entering that middle class of pitchers where it's like these guys have had some MLB success before at a consistent level. This isn't just their first year pitching at a high level or at a good level. Um, you know, who's your mid-level guy? Who's like that next step up for you? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's it's kind of hard to, you know, look around the market right now. You don't know exactly who's going to be sellers and who's not going to be sellers, but I will tell you who will be a seller, and I don't mean this as a dig. The Mets are going to be sellers. I mean, at the, what a couple of weeks for that franchise, for that fan base. You know, I, I kind of dig on the Mets, but I almost feel bad for them a little bit, but they're definitely going to be sellers at the deadline. That's kind of a, how some of their motivations were this past offseason. Let's get some short-term guys on contracts so that you know it, it, they can be serviceable. And if we need to sell, we can sell them. And one of those guys was Sean Manaya. He um, He's really towards the top of the Mets rotation this year. He's been one of their better pitchers. Um, his peripherals are super confusing, though. His peripherals look awful. His expected stats are terrible. A lot of hard contact. No swing and miss stuff. Walking a ton of guys. But the results are there. Uh, he has a 316 ERA, a 3.45 FIP, and a 1.29 WHIP. Um, you know, I, I, I would say I want this guy. But, you know, the peripherals aren't great. And I'm not sure I really want to give the Mets uh, prospects that they'll probably just ruin. I want to see those prospects go and be, you know, successful. But uh, I, I would still like him as a mid-tier option just because, you know, he's serviceable. It's not like he's going to be at the top of your rotation or making playoff starts. He'll probably be towards the back end. He'll, he'd probably make a lot of spot starts. Um, he actually does have a pretty nice sweeper. He's primarily a sinker baller, and he really mixes in his stuff a lot besides that uh, sinker. He's throwing everything about, you know, he's throwing his change up 16% of the time, his sweeper 15% of the time, his four seamer 12% of the time, and his cutter 12% of the time, which has been uh, a little successful this year, but it can use some work, and that's why I think he would work for the Yankees as well because. We all know Matt Blake is a cutter whisperer. I think that could be a pretty good match. Maybe Blake could get something out of him. But that's that's a nice mid-tier option on the market. He's a free agent after next year, I believe. I think it's like, I want to say, a $14 million average annual value. So, you know, the, the luxury tax hit wouldn't be insane. So, you know, that's a good mid-tier option. Ryan, who do you got for this kind of, Middle area, not too expensive, not too cheap either. 
Yeah, as a Shamaniah guy myself, I totally like what you're thinking there. And let's have some fun with stats here. Shamaniah has the same FIP uh, since May, since June of 2023 as Corbin Burns at 3.33. So you're basically just acquiring Corbin Burns, right? Like that's that's essentially, right? Like exactly, exactly, right? Like you can't, people lie, you know, stats don't lie. They don't, they don't. But my guy is a, the guy who has the most strikeouts in baseball at 90 and that's Jack Flaherty. And I do want to mention what you said about we don't know who sellers or buyers. The Mets are far more likely to sell, I think, at this point in time than the Tigers. If the Tigers have a good month of June, they might make the playoffs. So I think this one is one that's subject to change very quickly. Like, we know the White Sox are going to be bad, kind of going back to Eric Fetty. We kind of know the Nationals aren't going to make the playoffs, going back to Trevor Williams. But Flaherty is a little more in that gray zone. But his stuff, man, he has a 34% strikeout rate. That's the highest for any qualified starter. A 30.2% strikeout to walk rate because he's only walking 3.8% of batters faced. People are going to look at the one point two oh home runs per nine and go if he's giving up that many home runs in comerica imagine what's going to happen in the bronx well he only has a 4.3 percent barrel rate and an 87.6 uh average exit velocity it's not like he's running a high fly ball rate he has a 29.4 percent fly ball rate and a 45.6 percent ground ball rate his fastball plays up in the zone the slider and the curveball are two plus pitches in terms of uh you know getting swings and misses I think this is a guy who's due for a lot of positive regression. We started to see that ERA come down. He's got the high swing and miss stuff. He ranks in the 95th percentile on whiff rate at 35.2%. And if you look at the Yankee rotation and say, okay, he's not going to make a start for you in the postseason. Well, you know where the Yankees can use some swing and miss? In their bullpen. They could desperately use it. And, and kind of getting back to Manaya here, right? The Yankees don't have a reliable lefty. Caleb Ferguson is not the goods, man. He, he's just not. Manaya, you know, if you don't view him as a rotation guy in the postseason, I certainly view him as a bullpen option. Remember what the Giants did with him last year out of the bullpen? He was gross. He was one of the better relievers in baseball. So, you know, I think both these guys kind of serve as like, okay, they can help you in the rotation. They could definitely be your four or your five. I'd argue they could even be your three. Um, and then if they're your, in your bullpen, I expect them to be one of your three or four best relievers uh, in any given situation, even if you have a really good bullpen. So I like both these guys for that reason. Finally, though, let's get into the top, like the top of the market. Your guy, like the difference makers. The, this guy is pitching in game two when Garrett Cole pitched in game one or pitching game three, kind of however you want to put it. These guys are, are frontline starters. Who's your pick? And uh, kind of give me a reason for it. Yeah, so I think the more expensive guy I looked at on our market is Yusei Kikuchi. And I think he would be especially expensive because that would be an in-division trade with the Toronto Blue Jays. And I can't imagine the Blue Jays want to help out the Yankees at all. But that being said, Kikuchi is a free agent after this year. So maybe the Blue Jays wouldn't care that much. You know, they'll get some prospects. We'll probably get a good amount of prospects out of it because Kikuchi has been really, really solid this year. I don't know if he would be the three starter in the rotation, but he'd be pretty close to it. Um, you know, he doesn't exactly have swing and miss stuff, and he does let up a lot of hard contact, but he does not walk guys. He really doesn't walk any guys. Um, he's regularly pitching like six innings and has been really efficient. He's still, like, he doesn't have swing and miss stuff, but he still manages to get his strikeouts. He's okay at generating some ground balls. Like I said, I think this would be an expensive option because it's an in-division trade with the Blue Jays. You'd probably have to look up, you'd probably have to look at giving up, you know, probably a top 30 prospect at the very least, I would think, especially because it's a trade deadline trade. Prices are always going to run high on pitchers because pitchers are always the hot commodity at the trade deadline like we've seen. Um, but, you know, I I would like this option, Ryan, but I just I think it would cost too much. And unless the Yankees rotation, you know, takes a really big negative regression, like it just completely plummets, uh, I you know, I, I would want him then, but otherwise, I don't think it's really worth the price tag because it's not that big of a need. Uh, you know, if it were up to me, to be honest, I wouldn't give up anything and I would bring up someone from the minors, but, you know, no one in the minors is, you know, really pitching well right now. Will Warren has, you know, he's, he's not pitching great. Uh, I, I would say Clayton Beater, but I'm not really sure what you're going to get from him at the major league level right now. But like I said, you know, you say Kikuchi is an expensive option. He'd be really effective. I think he'd pitch good in the Bronx, but just too expensive. 
Yeah, I could hear you on that. I actually wrote an article, uh, I think earlier in like May or maybe like really late April, like some early kind of trade targets. And with the way that the Blue Jays have been playing, and I'm not trying to say they're completely out of it. I think it's crazy to say that any team's completely out of it in May when they're like right around 500. Um, but they don't look like they're in, their, in, their, in a great spot. I think Kikuchi kind of fits also the like, let's be real here. This guy just for some reason kills us. So, you know, pick up a Yankee killer. We have seen them make an in-division trade for a lefty before. Jay Happ, you know, not to bring back bad memories. But uh, another lefty that really interests me, and it's, it's fun that we're bringing about up lefties now... Jesus Cesardo. Jesus Cesardo, I think, is like the first guy Yankee fans think of when they think of a rotation upgrade. And what really stands out to me is that he's throwing uh, more sinkers in the in, in the month of May. So he's come back from the IL. He's mixing in more of his of his two seamer sinker kind of thing uh, with his four seamer. A one point seven five ERA. The velocity is down. The strikeout to walk rate has gotten better. The velocity being down does concern me a little bit. Like that's like coming back from like oh he had a sore elbow is definitely like one of those. If the Yankees go, if the Yankees decide not to trade for him, I would completely understand. Uh, but I've always felt like he's thrown his four seamer too much. I feel like he needed something to mask that pitch. It wasn't a high whiff pitch. Um, I, I felt like he needed something to kind of play off of it. Um, having his sinker in that mix has helped him a ton. Um, you know, obviously last year what he was able to do um, across what was it, 32 starts last year? Yeah, 32. He had a 3.58 ERA and a 28.1% strikeout rate. One of the best pitchers in the National League. I view him as somebody who could really take a step forward with the Yankees, and we're talking about a 26-year-old frontline starter, two and a half years of control, right? Like, to give you guys context, he's younger than Clark Schmidt. He is a year older than Luis Heal, right? Like, this is a young stud, right? Um, and, and so, you know, if I'm, it doesn't mean that I have to go put a lot of prospects. Absolutely. Um, could you potentially get him on a little bit cheaper because of the elbow she had earlier this year? Sure. Is that risky business? Yes, because we the last time the Yankees did that was Frankie Montas, where they tried to get a little bit of a discount. If you remember the trade, they really didn't give up anything notable uh, to get a guy who was considered the second best start at the deadline, and then he completely crashed because the shoulder issue came up to uh, kind of bite him in the butt. Um, but the way I look at it with Lazardo is he's a frontline guy. He's kind of gotten better at limiting the damage contact, which I always felt like was a big uh, kind of indicator that he may not have worked out as well in the Bronx. I, I didn't think it was going to work in New York if he's going to get hit that hard. Um, and we'll see from there in terms of like what his performance is. But I think I would almost favor Kikuchi to Lazardo because the Yankees have five starters, six starters under contract for the 2026 season, the 2025 season. Not to say I don't want more starting pitching, but just from, like, the Yankees are not going to pay a bunch of guys and Juan Soto. Like, they're going to pay Juan Soto if they do so, and I think they will. Um, and that's kind of the, the, the look internally for what they can do. I, I think they like their rotation structure. And also, I, I do want to make sure that I have somebody that, like, I don't need Schmidt back in my rotation. I think that's an important thing, too, because we are talking about an injury, an in-season injury. Coming back from an in-season injury can be tough. Do I think Schmidt can do it? Absolutely. I think his stuff is really good. I think he showed this year he really can be a frontline starter almost. Um, but I, I want to have some insurance to make sure he doesn't start a playoff game uh, if, he doesn't, if he doesn't pitch at that level. And then kind of tying into the ultimate point here regarding like having depth in your rotation they need depth and rotation. You can't have enough pitching. Turning good starters into relievers for you is going to be important as well. This bullpen has kind of shown that you are one or two injuries away. Like, the Jonathan Luizga injury has killed this bullpen. Uh, it really has. Hamilton, like, he... I think his last outing was very encouraging because he was just kind of dotting the outside part of the plate and getting whiffs. But, you know, he had not looked like himself all year. Um, and that really started to kill them. Like, they, they weren't ready for regression from one of their top guys. They lost another top bullpen arm. So, you know, as the season goes on, they're going to need to get more depth. And I think picking any I think honestly you can mix match two of these guys Aiden if you were to pick one of the three guys that I suggested and I'll pick one of the three that you suggested that you would trade for who's your option and why so we got Fetty we got Flaherty and we got Lazardo. these are all okay I I see I think I would pick Jack Flaherty actually you know I I think as as pretty as Lazardo's name sounds I think he would cost too much and I just think that the amount of team control he has just doesn't work um, in the picture for next year for the Yankees. So, you know, Lazardo would be great. That's expensive, though, and I'm not really sure he would make much of a difference. Um, I'd like Eric Fetty. That'd be a nice, cheap option. But, you know, something just tells me that it, it, it wouldn't go well. If, you're, if you want to go that cheap route, you might as well just call someone up from the minor leagues, I think. You know, maybe that could supplement as well as Eric Fetty would, even though he's having a pretty good season. Jack Flaherty, I, I pick him because, you know, 
it feels like it's just a matter of time before everything starts clicking for that guy. He's been, you know, a lot better this year. Um, like you said, he's given up a lot of home runs, but, you know, his barrel rate is very low. I don't think he would cost terribly much. He's a free agent at the end of this year. I think his luxury tax hit would be like 11 or 12 million or something. So I think Jack Flaherty is who I had picked just because, you know, I also wouldn't want a lefty. That's another reason I wouldn't want Lazardo. The Yankees already have two lefties in the rotation. Jack Flaherty is, you know, a pretty hard throwing righty, and he's been, you know, getting a lot better this year. So Ryan, who are, who are you picking for me? Because you know, I like Kikuchi a lot. Not sure about Manaya. I do like Trevor Williams though. So who are you picking out of those three? You know, interestingly enough, I think out of that pool, so as you mentioned with like Kikuchi, you know, you are kind of buying high maybe a little bit. And I actually just saw in his last start, he had his lowest fastball velo of the season and didn't get any whiffs. And it was in Detroit. I don't know if the weather was like cold or anything, but that's always a concern because he does have some injury concerns. I would say probably Trevor Williams, right? Like, again, I, I think my, my answer usually would be Kikuchi. Uh, but if I couldn't pick him and if, you know, I kind of want to maybe see where he goes there. I think Williams makes a lot of sense, right? Like he just kind of, he has three plus pitches in a, in a four seamer sweeper changeup. That's going to help against lefties and righties. Um, and the sweeper is really damn good. And I also view him kind of as somebody can just plug and play into my bullpen uh, if needed. So um, yeah, I, I think I'm a, I think I, I would sign up for some Trevor Williams action. Um, but yeah, no guys, if you guys are interested in, in picking up where we're picking down, what we're picking down, or, or you know, picking between our starters, you guys can check, t uh, have a conversation with us in the comment section below. You guys can also have a conversation with us on Twitter. Our Twitter accounts are above our heads, and our social media platforms are at Fireside Yankees. It's at Fireside Yankees on Instagram, uh, but at Fireside Yankees on Twitter. TikTok, Facebook, and of course this YouTube page. You guys can also check out EmpireSportsMedia.com for all of your favorite New York sports coverage and content. Uh, and of course, you guys can check out, uh, well, I already talked about our personal Twitter accounts, but I'm just going to talk about them again. You guys should check out our personal Twitter accounts because we're talking about the Yankees all the time. And honestly, I think there's a lot of fun in engaging in conversation with you guys. If you guys are interested in betting content, we have Fireside Bets. Um, and, you know, of course, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Fireside family, you guys have been great. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Let's go, Yankees. Peace out. Perfect.